Well, you may be wondering why we are uh, taking a break from the book of Matthew and going to the Song of Songs. If you've been with us, you know that we uh, just finished up the Sermon on the Mount last week, and so uh, now we're, we're going to something new, and we're actually going to, to work our way through uh, the book of the Song of Songs. And this, this, you, you, this may be uh, um, strange to you because the, the Song of Songs is a difficult book. Uh, it's a difficult book to understand. It can be confusing, uh, even just in terms of following the, 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 the narrative, the, the back and forth of who's speaking uh, in the song uh, can be challenging, um, and it can be you know, hard to understand. You know, why is a book like this in the Bible, which speaks uh, of romantic love and even at different points uh, sexual love, uh, why is a book like this uh, in the Bible? Uh, but the, the fact is that this book isn't in the Bible, and it has many important things to teach us both about sexuality in marriage and even more fundamentally about the love which the Lord Jesus Christ has for his people. And then even perhaps more than that, the, the fact that these two things are related. Now, uh, it's probably a bit less common to, to hear a sermon series on the Song of Songs today. Uh, in the Lord's providence, since preparing for this sermon, I've actually been shown a few sermon, uh, sermon series on this. So, uh, I know it's not completely true that people avoid this, this book, but historically, historically, this was actually a very regular book for people to preach on. Uh, and uh, not only that, but it was universally understood as being first and foremost about the love which Christ has for his people. In fact, uh, even the Jews before the coming of Christ understood this song to be about that. Uh, historically, the Jews would actually read this, this book on the Passover. Uh, each year they would read it on the Passover because uh, the, the remembrance of the redemption of God's people out of Egypt was the great act where God took his people to himself in a kind of marriage covenant relationship. And so they would recognize that the Song of Songs is in fact uh, about this and they would uh, read this song at that occasion, and Christian interpretation as well, all throughout the centuries, has always understood this song to be first and foremost about Christ uh, and the church. This, this did change probably the past two to 300 years uh, with uh, some of the, the higher critical ways of looking at the, at the Bible. Uh, they really got a, a great hold, not only in the academy, but even in the church, such that, that now uh, the predominant view, even for conservatives, uh, is that this book is first and foremost about human love, about human marriage, uh, about what it means to be married uh, and to, to enjoy even romantic uh, love. Now, I'm going to be arguing, and, and particularly this is going to be the goal of this particular sermon, I'm going to be arguing that this song is, again, first and foremost, it's first and foremost about, it's about the way in which Christ has shown love to his people the way in which Christ has a relationship with his people. And I, now the, the, the obvious uh, objection that you may have is, well, doesn't this, song, doesn't this song speak of human love? It seems very clearly to be about this. If, you know, we, we just uh, read you know, uh, uh, clearly a woman who's in love, uh, desiring to be kissed with the kisses of his mouth, clearly speaking about uh, a, a person that she loves who is uh, apart from her, who, uh, who she has this romantic relationship with. And the answer is yes. The song does, in fact, speak not only about the way in which Christ loves his people, but also about uh, the way in which a man and woman uh, love one another. And this is why it's important, even as we, we think about this song, that we understand not only the fact that this song speaks about Christ in the church, but also the way in which this song speaks about Christ in the church. Because... This song teaches us, and we'll see there are a number of things within the song itself that point to the reality. This is about more than just human love. There are a number of, of things that, that, speak, that, that point us to this being about Christ and the church, and yet this is not meant in any way to detract from the clear understanding that this is also about human love. And the reason this is important is because one of the things that's happening in the Song of Solomon is the song draws a link between the love that God has for his people and love within the marriage relationship such that love within the marriage relationship is to, to find its surest foundation and uh, its ultimate meaning in the relationship that God has with his people. That's one of the things that is meant to be communicated in the Song of Songs such that when you read this song, and there's very many things that you can very obviously apply to a marriage if you're in a, if you are married here today, there's so many things that, that 
uh, that you can use in this way, but, but also uh, the way in which these things are described point forward to and are reflections on the love that God has shown to his people. Now, one of the reasons then, and this goes back to why I, I've chosen to, to do a series on the Song of Songs, uh, is that uh, one reason to, to, to go to this particular book is because today one of the, the greatest challenges of the church is uh, the challenge that is coming to the church via the, the new sexual revolution that's happening, uh, the kind of sexual ethic that we are told you know, we must uh, adopt as the church, we must compromise with, we, we must affirm homosexuality and everything that comes along with that, every, every form of kind of, of sexual aberration that's out there, that uh, if, you, if you hold to a normal view, what has historically been the understanding of marriage as between one man and one woman, and that sex is to be uh, restrained and constricted only to that relationship, we're told that that is old-fashioned. We're told that this is something that, the, that shows that the church is backwards, that it's actually an immoral thing for the church to hold uh, to these kinds of things. And even as we think about the response that the church gives to that, we do need to say, it's actually the case that the Bible condemns all these other forms of sexuality uh, and it teaches that they're sins. But one other thing that is important for us to do is to put forward, as it's shown in the scriptures, the beauty positively of sex as God has given it. And that's what we find in the Song of Songs. And the beauty and full significance of the, ro the romantic relationship that a man has with a woman is seen in the fact that that, that uh, union and intimacy is actually a reflection of God's love for his people. And that is actually where the romantic love between a man and a woman finds its deepest significance. And so if you were to ask then, you know, if you're married here, why is it important that you strive for a healthy kind of sexuality within your marriage? The answer is because that sexual intimacy that you have with your spouse uh, is in fact a reflection of the love that Christ has for his people. And so insofar as you love Christ, you are to strive for this. And if you're single, why is it the case that you should keep yourself pure for marriage? The answer is because you are to keep yourself pure for marriage because it's, it's part of what it means for the people of God. It's a reflection of the people of God keeping itself pure for Christ. That there's a connection between all these things. Why are you to, uh, to uh, turn away from the sexual ethic of this world? Uh, not just because the Bible says it's wrong, but because the sexual ethic of this world carries with it a denial of the gospel itself. It, it carries with it a view of the world that is not compatible with Christianity. And therefore, to, to turn away from what the scriptures say about, about our sexuality is in fact in itself to deny the gospel and even to turn your back on Christ who loves you. This song, this song is ultimately about Christ, and it shows not just the negative element of sex, what we cannot do, but really the full significance and beauty of what God meant when he gave these very things to us, these, these very good gifts, and even, as we'll see, that these things are meant to point to Christ. And so uh, this sermon this morning is going to be something of an introduction. Uh, next week, we're actually going to look at the same passage. We're going to look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through uh, 2, 7. The goal of this sermon is to show you ways in which, as we look at the song as a whole, to show you ways in which the song itself is meant to be taken as more than simply human love. That's going to be the goal of this sermon. And then to show then further that if that's the case, then it has great implications for human love. So that, that's going to be, going to be uh, the goal of this particular sermon. So we'll, we'll look at this uh, uh, this topic under two headings. We'll, we'll first consider how the sermon, how, how the Song of Songs speaks of Christ, and then the implications that this has uh, for, for human marriage. So that'll be the, the way in which we proceed here. Now, as I mentioned, it's, it's not sufficient just to say that the song is about Christ. It's also very important that you understand how the song speaks of Christ. How is it the case that this song actually points forward to the love that Christ has for his people. And the way in which this song actually does this is in a number of ways, but primarily through actually uh, giving indications and connections, uh, allusions to other parts of scripture that are about Christ and uh, the coming salvation that he himself would bring. And there are a number of things that the Song of Songs develops that are, uh, that are taught in, in other places in the scriptures 
that are clearly about something that's more than simply romantic love. And so as the Song of Songs adopts these themes and develops them in the context of describing human love, it basically, uh, it basically gives a, a redemptive element in terms of the meaning of romantic love. It gives a redemptive element uh, to the meaning of what it means to have uh, a sexual relationship in the context of marriage. Now, one of the things, before we get into anything specific about these connections with other uh, places in the Old Testament, um, it's important for us to ask, why is it the case? Why is it the case that there is a connection between, and again, I'm going to be trying to prove this later, but why is it important to recognize that there is a connection between uh, human sexuality and the relationship that God has with his people? That is to say, why is there, in fact, this connection? Why is there a relationship between uh, these things? Now, one of the reasons is because not only just with the scriptures, but every expression, every expression of sexuality in this world is connected with a view of the world. It's connected with a view of the world, and, and one's sexual expression is actually uh, one of the predominant ways in which you express your view of the world. And so, for instance, in the Old Testament, this is the reason why there is a, a very big difference between the sexual ethic of the people of God and the sexual ethic of all of the pagan nations around Israel. If you think of, uh, of uh, you know, all of the, the pagan nations around Israel, they would have uh, cult prostitutes. And so there would be um, an openness to a, a greater sexual expression, so to speak. And part of the reason for this is that it was connected to their view of the gods. They believed that there would be a, a fertility that would happen. And so if you, you, know, if you uh, engage in these kinds of practices, it would actually, you know, the gods would look down, they'd be pleased, and then there would be some kind of fertility that would come. And so the, the sexual expression of uh, the pagans ar around Israel uh, was related to their view of the way they thought the world worked. And what's important to note is it's the exact same way today, even for those who do not believe in the scriptures. The reason why there is so much pressure on the church to abandon the sexual ethic that is found in the scriptures and to embrace something else is because those who are putting that pressure on the church are, uh, by putting this pressure on the church, trying to get the church to abandon the biblical worldview. That is to say, the adoption of the kind of sexual practices that are becoming more and more common today carries with it and is rooted in a certain view of the world that is consistent with all of these things. It's a view of the world where boundaries and distinctions were, uh, are, are uh, disintegrated, where, there are, uh, where there's a throwing off of all kinds of authority. And the way in which this expresses itself, uh, almost, it's, it's almost the most important way in which this expresses itself, uh, is through sexual behavior. And this is the reason why throwing off God must always include a revolution with regard to sexual ethics. And that's the reason why there's this pressure on the church. However, not only is it the case that, that unbelieving uh, views of the world correspond to unbelieving forms of sexual practice, both ancient and modern, whether it be Israel's neighbors or even uh, our own neighbors today, it's also the case that the sexual ethic in the scriptures corresponds to our view of God. That is to say, the, the, the reason why sexuality is the way it is for us is because of our view of God. There are a number of connections between the marriage relationship and intimacy within it and our view of God. And so, for instance, whereas uh, the, the pagans in, in the ancient times and even those around us today will deny the, the, the truth of the one God and they'll look for spirituality in all kinds of different ways. So too, they seek to express their sexuality in all kinds of different ways. They don't limit it to just one person. We, however, believe in one God and we have a relationship to the one God via covenant. And marriage is a reflection of this. Marriage is a covenant relationship between just two people. Just as we believe in one God, we have a covenant relationship with that God. So too, in marriage, there is a relationship with one other person. And that relationship is established just like our relationship with God on the basis of covenant. And it is a great unfaithfulness to, uh, to abandon the covenant relationship that we have with God. And in the same way, it's a great act of unfaithfulness to abandon the covenant relationship that you have with another person in marriage. Marriage is the only relationship that uh, is rooted in covenant in such a way that it creates a bond that's stronger than blood. And in that way, it is uniquely... It is a unique expression of and reflection of the covenant relationship that God has with his people. And just like, um, so just like in our covenant relationship with God, uh, the marriage relationship is exclusive. 
God doesn't seek another people. He has one people for himself. We don't seek other gods. We have one God. And in the marriage relationship, there is one man who doesn't seek another woman. He, he clings to his wife. And so the wife also seeks, uh, seeks not to have other men, but simply to have the one man that she is in covenant relationship with. And just like uh, in our relationship with God, that's rooted in covenant, so too in marriage, this covenant relationship, that's the, the closest relationship of any on earth, uh, gives to us uh, access uh, and a, an intimacy with the other party in the covenant that is only shared with that person. So there is an intimacy that we have with God on the basis of the covenant relationship that we have with him, that God actually lives in us by the Spirit. It's a, a kind of intimacy that is quite different than anything else that the world can ever experience. And so too, uh, sexual activity within marriage is the greatest expression of intimacy that is rooted in the, the covenant relationship that establishes that, that, that relationship. So the covenant is the foundation for the expression of intimacy within the relationship. And this is why, this is why then, uh, all throughout the Old Testament, there's always a connection between um, idolatry and adultery. That the prophets will always describe Israel's turning to other gods, Israel's turning to idols as being an adultery. You have violated the covenant, which establishes this intimate relationship between God and his people. It's the, the same kind of violation that we see uh, in the marriage relationship. And this, so, for instance, Ezekiel, uh, for, uh, Hosea chapters 1 through 3, in very many ways, uh, the prophet Hosea will speak about the people of God uh, being unfaithful and therefore being adulterers. There's a very, very graphic description of this also in Ezekiel chapter 16, where, the, where there is this long metaphor of the people of God described as, as a woman who was taken, uh, was found on the side of the mountain in her blood, and God was merciful and gracious, came and, and uh, washed her, gave her every kind of benefit, entered into this covenant relationship with her, and then uh, she becomes a whore, and she turns away from God. And the way in which this happened was when the people of God turned away to other gods, there is a, a connection between idolatry and adultery. And even we see, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 50, that uh, God will even say, I have sent you away with a certificate of divorce uh, because of these things. And that would have been reflected in the exile. There is a divorce um, such that the covenant relationship was in some sense dissolved. Now, it didn't completely go away. God brought his people back, of course. Um, but there was a, a dissolution of a covenant relationship, which is compared to a divorce. And this is because there's this connection between these things. And even, even further than that, the hope that the people of God have in terms of the restoration of that relationship is described in the prophets also as the restoration of a marriage relationship. So for instance, in Isaiah chapter 54, Isaiah uh, writes this, and particularly in verse 5, and this is, uh, if you remember the context, this is immediately after the description of the, the servant of the Lord who would come and who would die for his people to save them. So this is uh, immediately after the prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ, the very famous one in Isaiah 53. And we're, we read this, for your maker is your husband. The, the Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is, is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were, uh, when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness. I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Or again, in Isaiah chapter 62, we read this. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The culmination of redemption is the reestablishment and the consummation of a covenant relationship between God and his people. Now, if this is the case, if this is the way that the prophets speak so regularly, and if, this is, if there's all these correspondences between God's love for his people and uh, the marriage relationship, then we would expect some kind of connection to one's relationship with God in the Song of Songs which celebrates this very relationship. We should at least expect this to be the case. And we, in fact, do find this to be the case when we consider a number of important factors about the song itself. The first is, this is not 
simply a description of a marriage of two random people. The, the, the characters in the story are in fact quite important. It is not the marriage of any particular man, but it is rather the marriage of Solomon. And this is quite important uh, because if this is in fact a marriage between two random people, then we could say, well, perhaps there is no connection. This is just about uh, human love and that's it. However, such a view cannot explain why the author speaks of Solomon so regularly, that the song is in fact dedicated to him, that this is not even the, the marriage of a normal person, but it is in fact the, the, the marriage of one who is the king. It's a marriage of the one who is crowned, and even his coronation is recorded in chapter 3 of the song. Why is it the case that this song would go out of its way to describe the bridegroom as being Solomon? The reason is because this song is about more than simply human love. It is about Solomon because Solomon is the son of David, and as the son of David, his entire life was meant to point forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember in 2 Samuel chapter 7, there is a, uh, the, the covenant which was given to David where it was promised to David that one of his sons would sit on the throne, would have an everlasting kingdom, and would build the house for the name of God. Now, this was in some ways fulfilled with Solomon. He was a son of David. Uh, he was given a kingdom, and he built a house for God. However, there are a number of things even in the, in the Davidic covenant which clearly show that Solomon did not ultimately fulfill these things and that the ultimate fulfilling of, of them was always pointing forward to uh, a further con uh, consummation in another person. So for instance, we have uh, in uh, Zechariah chapter 6, a prophecy, and Zechariah is a long time after Solomon, hundreds of years after Solomon's death, and yet Zechariah speaks of one who will come and who will build the house of the Lord. Now, if Solomon built the house of the Lord and fulfilled the Davidic covenant, why is it that the prophets continue to speak of another one who will come as a son of David, who will have an everlasting kingdom, and who will build the house of the Lord? The reason is because uh, Solomon was never recognized. Even in his own day, he was not recognized as being the one who ultimately fulfilled that. Solomon was meant to be understood as a type, such that when you see Solomon described, everything about his life is meant to point forward to the, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have then, uh, with the Song of Songs, not just the marriage of any particular person, but particularly uh, the marriage of Solomon, the king, the son of David, who is the one who will build the house of God. He is, in some sense, God's Messiah. And, and we have in the scriptures a full book dedicated to his marriage, to his marriage. Now, some people will object at this point because at the end of chapter 8, particularly in verses 11 and, and 12, in the Song of Songs, there seems to be a kind of negative comment towards Solomon as the very, very end of the song. And some people actually use this to say that the Song of Songs actually has three characters, that Solomon's actually the enemy, he's the, he's the bad person in this song. It's not actually about his marriage, but it's about his, uh, his um, lustful pursuit of this woman who um, is actually in love with another person, the shepherd. And uh, he and she com com uh, continually re rebuffs Solomon, and then at the very end of the story, uh, is reunited with her shepherd. The problem with this is um, a number of things. First, the very beginning of the song is dedicated to Solomon. So it'd be quite strange if the song is then, speaking of Solomon, is like the greatest enemy. Uh, secondly, Solomon appears to be positive all the way throughout the book. It's only really at the very end that there's this one negative comment about him. And the reason why there can be a negative comment about Solomon is because this provides one of the hints that this song, even as it describes Solomon's marriage, is really speaking about the ideal Solomon. It's really speaking about Solomon as he was meant to be, but never was, as he will be ideally in Christ. And so there is this Solomon who's described very positively, and then right at the end, a postscript in, in the song, so to speak, as uh, the, the author kind of takes a step back and gives some kind of general exhortations. All of a sudden now, there is a negative comment towards Solomon, to, as, it, as if to say, Solomon, the, the real Solomon has not actually come. And then the very last words of the song then are an appeal for Solomon to come. Let, let the beloved come, be like a gazelle and come. And so there is an expectation. There is a, an ideal Solomon who's going to come who will fulfill the things that are written in this song in ways that Solomon never did. And we know, of course, Solomon's failures with, with women. Uh, he, the, the song is probably historically referring to a, the, the marriage that he had with the Pharaoh's daughter, where he did have actually a monogamous relationship for some time. But clearly there is a disconnect between Solomon and the language of this song. This song celebrates monogamous, 
faithful marriage love. And yet Solomon was quite far from that. You know, the book of 1 Kings uh, tells us he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. At some point, he gave up his monogamy, his monogamous relationship, and went off uh, after uh, uh, lots of other women who turned his heart away from the Lord. Uh, and yet we have this song that celebrates the marriage of such a person. Why is it the case that this could be true? Because there is ultimately going to be a better Solomon who will come. And this is actually made even more sure in terms of an in, in interpretation by the connection between the Song of Songs and Psalm 45, which is very important for our understanding of, of the Song of Songs. And the reason this is important is because um, Psalm 45 is a, is a psalm that is all about the celebration of the marriage of the Messiah. And, it's, and r- whereas the Song of Songs speaks of Solomon and Solomon being a type of the Messiah, Psalm 45 is actually explicit about saying this is a psalm about the Messiah. And there are a number of important connections between the Song of Songs and Psalm 45. These are the only two songs in the entire Bible that have extended descriptions of of, uh, the body of of different people uh, in the context of romantic love. The only songs in the entire Bible. And yet, and yet Psalm 45 speaks of the Messiah being given an everlasting kingdom in verse 6 clearly we're uh, built building on uh, the Davidic covenant where there was a, a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom promised to the son of David. And then in verse seven, it describes God's anointing the king and even calls the king who is anointed God himself. Now, if you remember the word Messiah means the anointed one. That's what Messiah means. It's what Christ means. When we say that we believe Jesus is the Christ, we're saying we believe he's anointed one. Here, the psalm is saying that he wasn't just anointed by a prophet. You know, think of Samuel who anointed uh, Saul the king and then David the king. This Messiah who has an everlasting kingdom is anointed directly by God. And the entire psalm is a long description and celebration of the marriage of the, of the, uh, of the ideal coming Messiah who has an everlasting kingdom. And there are, as I said, a number of connections between, uh, between uh, these two uh, portions of Scripture. Uh, Jonathan Edwards has uh, given a, a, a long description of the relationship between these two, and this is a fairly lengthy quote, but I think it's worth it to, to read. He's comparing the relationship between Psalm 45 and the Song of Songs and showing the importance of the interpretation of, of uh, Song of Songs and uh, it building on particularly Psalm 45. He writes this, Both these songs... Treat of these lovers with relation to their espousals one to another, representing their union to that of a bridegroom and a bride. In both, the bridegroom is represented as a king, and in both, the bride is spoken of as a king's daughter. In both, the bridegroom is represented as greatly delighted with the beauty of the bride. In both, the speech of the bridegroom is represented as exceedingly excellent and pleasant. In both, the ornaments of the bride are represented by costly, beautiful, and splendid attire, and in both, as adorned with gold." In both the excellent gifts and, or qualifications of these lovers by which they are recommended to each other and delighted in, in one another are compared to such spices as myrrh, aloes, and other things. And in both these songs, the bride is represented as with a number of virgins that are her companions in her nuptial honors and joys. That is to say, uh, if Psalm 45 is speaking about, and it seems to explicitly be speaking about, the marriage of the Messiah with his people, then it must also be the case that the Song of Songs, which is built on that psalm in some ways, is also speaking uh, of uh, this very same thing. So the Song of Songs is about the relationship that Christ has with his people. There are other arguments, though, as well, that that show that this uh, is, in fact, the intention of uh, of the song. Uh, One of the things that's very difficult, and particularly in, in modern scholarship, is there's a uh, there's arguments of, as to whether or not the Song of Songs is a unity. Some people believe it's just an anthology of songs uh, because it, they'll argue you know, there just seems to be no connection between the different chapters, the different sections of the, of the song. It just seems like someone just threw together randomly uh, a number of different songs and they're all about love and that's kind of what bound them together. However, there is a very clear progression in the Song of Songs. And we're even told at the very beginning that we ought to expect this. Notice the very first verse of the, of the song says, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. The singular song, which is called the greatest song, which is Solomon's. The understanding of the author is that this book is a unity. And the unity, even the storyline, the progression, uh, shows that this is about the relationship that God has with his people. And so uh, one of the things that shows this uh, particularly is 
um, the theme throughout the whole song of absence. Now, it may, this may be strange to think about, but in most of the Song of Songs, the lovers are actually not together. They're actually desiring to be the, together. Um, at the beginning, when the woman says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, it's because she's not with him. The same thing happens in chapter 2 at the end, which we'll come to in a couple weeks. Uh, in verses 8 through 17, she is pleading for, her, for the beloved to come down the hills like a gazelle to be, to be quick to come. In chapter 3, she dreams that, he is, that she's with him, but he's not actually there. It's not until the end of chapter 3 that he actually comes. This, this, this book is about love as you wait in eager expectation for the coming of the one that you love. And in this way, and in this way, it is very much related to the uh, cry of the people of God in every age as we await in the Old Testament, waiting for the coming of the Messiah, and now for us as we await the return of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. As I mentioned, this is even the ending of, of the song. The very last words that are said, very similar to the end of the book of Revelation, come, come, be like a gazelle and come. She's not actually with him. And the absence of, the absence of the lover from the beloved makes the feeling of love stronger. And it particularly resonates with the biblical pattern of exile and restoration. The people of God are in exile. The, the lovers are separated and they need to return one to another. But then even further, as we consider the way in which they return, we also find indication that this is about more than simply a human love. The consummation of the marriage happens in chapter 4. It goes on through uh, chapter 5, verse 1. It's the longest description of the woman's body, and clearly there is the, the coming together in love. But what's interesting is as the woman's body is described, it is described as a garden. If you're, if you're wondering why is it the case that um, you know, there's these kind of strange images that's being used to describe the woman, well, the reason is because it is describing the woman's body as a garden. The consummation of a marriage is like the return from exile, and being with God again in the Garden of Eden. That's the point. A number of scholars have actually pointed this out, that it's not just any garden that's being uh, described. It seems to be an allusion to the Garden of Eden. If you want to know on earth something that kind of reflects or points to uh, the, the restoration with God, what it will be like, it is like two lovers that are separated for a long time and who come together in the context of covenant marriage commitment and have sexual intimacy. That intimacy, the, the strongest feeling of intimacy, the strongest act of intimacy that can happen in this life is the reflection that is given of what the intimacy will be like between God and his people. There is, uh, uh, even interestingly in the, in the song, um, and this is really what makes it quite a poetic song, and, and we'll hopefully be able to see this. This is a beautiful song. It is, it is simply amazing. It truly is uh, the song of songs, so to speak, that is to say the greatest of songs. There is always this ambiguity between whether or not the lovers are present and even where they are. So, for instance, the lovers come into a garden and there is a description of the garden and then there is this transition without any transition being given. At some point, it seems like they could be in a garden, but also the woman's body is the garden. There is this, this movement back and forth um, that, that tries to show that... that uh, they may be actually in a garden, uh, but the actual act itself is like being in a paradise. That, that is uh, the point of the song. And there's a, a bunch of uh, ambiguities like that. We'll, we'll come to them in, in due time. But there is, uh, in this story, this, this, this movement of moving from exile to being back in the presence of one that you love. Even further than that, in the song, in terms of its progression, it actually happens in a twofold way. The consummation happens in chapter 4. There's a time of exile, then there's a consummation in chapter 4, and then immediately after this in chapter 5, the next thing that happens is they're separated again. So there's a consummation where there is a, a love that's established on the basis of covenant, and then immediately they are uh, set apart from one another, and they long to be in the presence of another again. And this is, uh, corresponds to, to the biblical pattern that we see all throughout the Bible, that there is, for instance, in the Passover, the people of God, we're in exile, they're brought into the presence of God. However, then they go into exile again and they await the second consummation with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The twofold exile and restoration is the great storyline of the Bible. And we see this even with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Christ has come once, we have the feelings of his love, but immediately he's taken from us. Immediately he's taken from us and then the rest of our existence is our 
our longing to be back with the one that we love. And this is exactly what the Song of Songs describes. Solomon comes and there is the relationship. It's established. It's beautiful. It's glorious. And yet, and yet there is again the feelings of separation. There's again the longings as you await the return of the great king who is the lover of his bride. We even see, uh, again, this will be the, the last one we, we touch on to show that the song is in fact about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the theme of the transformation of the woman. In the beginning, in chapter one, she described herself as dark. She says she's lovely, but she doesn't want anyone to look on her because of all the hard labor she's done. She's basically been in slavery, very much like the people of God were in slavery uh, in Egypt before the initial act of redemption. Uh, she doesn't consider herself to be lovely, but yet at the very end, in a number of places, she describes herself as lovely and everyone wants to look upon her. That is to say, the woman in the Song of Songs, one of the great themes that carries through the whole thing is that the woman is transformed by the love of the king. The woman is transformed by the love of the king. And this is exactly what we find uh, in the gospel as well. The Lord Jesus Christ comes and he comes to die for his people. And in dying for his people, he's able now to present his people without spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing to God. We were not lovely. We were in our bondage and slavery to sin, laboring and serving the devil himself. And yet we are transformed by the love of the king. All of these themes in the Song of Songs point forward, point beyond themselves to the reality of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Song of Songs is meant to be understood as a description of Christ and his love for the church. Now, if all this is true, you may be wondering, well, if this is the case, does it say anything at all about marriage? Uh, if it's only about the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, uh, and uh, his relationship to his people, then perhaps we just should recognize, we should read it in that way and then say, you know, there's nothing we can apply uh, to human marriage. But this is not the way that the song is meant to be understood. Clearly, there is a relationship to marriage. All of the descriptions of everything are in the context of human marriage. And again, the, the, the reason this is important is because one of the things the, psalm is, the song is trying to do is to draw a link between the sexual intimacy of marriage and the relationship that Christ has with the church. That's the point. The, 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 the act of sexual intimacy within marriage finds its deepest meaning, its firmest foundation in the great acts of redemption that Christ himself has accomplished. And this is, this is why then as, as we think about the way in which the, 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 the song speaks of Christ and the church, we have to say, uh, we have to distinguish between what's historically been called the allegorical interpretation and the typological interpretation. In allegory, in the allegorical interpretation, uh, people will argue that the song is about Christ because it cannot be about marriage. And they'll try to show things in the song that just don't fit the, the, uh, the, a description of marriage. And so we know it's about Christ because even though it's given in language related to marriage, it can't actually be about a real marriage. And so there is a pitting of the messianic interpretation against the, the more natural interpretation. Those two go, do, do not go together. However, in a typological interpretation, the description of the marriage, the marriage, uh, the, the, the description of the marriage of Solomon does not take away from but enhances the messianic uh, interpretation. The, there is a connection between the two such that you don't, you don't pit them against one another, but the one, even in its imperfections, points forward to a greater and fuller, uh, fuller experience. And this is the reason why, again, Solomon is called a type. It's not that um, Solomon uh, was going to fulfill everything, but he has to fulfill some things that were promised because his whole life is a type of what is coming. If you want to know what, it, what, what the Messiah is going to be like, well, Solomon will tell you something about it. He'll tell you something about what is, in fact, going to come. And the same is true for this particular song. Uh, it is given in the language of marriage not to drive a wedge between Christ and the idea of marriage, but rather to ground marriage in the reality that Christ has come. And if this is the case, then, if this is the case, then, we can say very firmly, as we think about the pressures that are on the church to uh, to give into the sexual ethic of, of the world, we can say very firmly that we actually have the highest view of sexual intimacy that is possible. And the reason we will not in any way compromise with the world is because we will not, we will not under any circumstance give up this great and glorious meaning of sex. 
And if we do, if we turn away, if we turn away from these things, it would be like taking a great diamond and simply putting it through the mud and having no care whatsoever for the value and the glory of that diamond. Uh, it's not to say that we are, when we say, you know, the scriptures say that we will not do this or that thing, that we're just, you know, it's because we have this, this low view of, of these things. It's rather that we have the highest view of it and we will not allow it to be made impure. We will not allow it to be made impure. The highest view, the highest uh, thoughts possible of human sexuality are found in the scriptures. Human sexuality is good. It's a, a thing that if you're married, you must pursue diligently. It is your obligation to see that in your marriage that you are cultivating a good, healthy sexual relationship with your wife or your husband. It's your duty to do this. And the doing of this is uh, to be done out of faith and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the not doing of, this, of any of the sexual activities that, are, that the world celebrates uh, is also to be done out of love for Christ. I do not worship more than one God. I do not worship these other gods. I do not believe uh, in uh, uh, the, the, the idea that all authority uh, is um, must be rebelled against and that all divisions between men and women must be broken down. There could be nothing that restrains, uh, restrains my freedom. I believe that I am free insofar as I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I serve him and I serve him alone. And I express that faithfulness to my one God by also being faithful to my one spouse whom he has given to me. That is what the Song of Songs uh, teaches us. And this is, this is what the ethic, the sexual ethic of uh, of, the, of, of the scriptures itself is rooted in. It is rooted in the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so brothers and sisters, we're going to be looking at this over the next uh, coming weeks, and hopefully we'll see uh, these very things, that even as the Song of Songs draws these connections between Christ and, uh, and marriage itself, we will also see the, the great exaltation of monogamy, the great exaltation of sexual intimacy, uh, the great exaltation of modesty, and of being faithful to one person. May it be that God would so make you faithful in the covenant relationship that you have with God, that you would have a, a truly, in this sense, monogamous relationship with the one God, that even as you are committed to him in covenant relationship, that you would be faithful to him in all things, and that this would particularly show forth in the way in which you keep yourself unstained from the world, like a bride who keeps herself pure for her husband. May God so give you the grace so to be found pure for him on the last day. Let's pray.